Welcome to River Foursquare. We are a church that meets in communities all around the Seattle area and online. And if you are joining us for the very first time, would you take a moment and go to riverfoursquare.org and click on the connect tab and fill out that form so that we can know that you're joining us today. If you're watching this and it's Sunday morning and it's Facebook where you found us and it's 10 a.m., go ahead and click on that link in the comments. There is one open for you where we have a virtual community that meets and discusses the questions that are going to come up in the middle of our message because our message is not just a long monologue of things. It is a broken up into discussion questions and we want to interact with one another and learn from one another and grow with one another because discipleship happens in community and that's what we really believe here at River. If you are in the Seattle area and you want to join an in-person community, we have four currently running and we are always open to adding more. So if there's not one that you find at riverfoursquare.org under that connect tab and River Communities that works for your time and, and when you can meet at church, let us know and we will figure out how to make one happen for you. Uh, currently we have two in Federal Way, one in Auburn, and one in Covington, Washington. And we would love to have you join one of those communities and come on out and be a part. Our next all-community gathering, which is where all of our local communities, anyone that's flying in from out of town, uh, wants to come together. We celebrate Jesus. We have communion. We hear testimonies of what God is doing and get to connect with one each other in a large group setting. Uh, that is happening on June 26th. You can also register for that at riverforsquare.org, click on that connect tab, click on all community gathering, and you can register to come and join us for that. We are still following some social distancing protocols um, with all the laws and rules that are happening in Washington. So, you know, please be prepared for that. But we love to have you come out and join us for worship, for prayer, for communion. If you need something happening in your life and you're not a part of River and you're like, you know, what? I just need a moment with God, come on out to that community gathering. Our worship and our prayer, everything there is focused on connecting with Jesus. Uh, not that we don't do that now, but that is a very dedicated time to see God do what he says he will do in our lives through healing, through um, transformation, and through connecting with one another. So we're going to get back into the book of Acts today. Father, we just thank you right now that your presence is here, that you are with us, that you are for us, and that you are guiding us. Continue to teach us how to walk out life like you originally planned it. In the name of Jesus, amen. So last week we talked about that when we come to Christ, notice that key phrase, that when we come to Christ is we don't add Jesus to us. We are added to to him. And that being said is Jesus isn't just a philosophy. He isn't just something we adapt. He isn't just mindsets and, and fancy cliche quotes we put in filigree on, on walls and we buy on Etsy. Okay, That's not who Jesus is. Who Jesus is, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so what he says, go. And we as believers is we have to know that we've been crucified with Christ. Back to that Galatians 2.20. For as I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Memorize that. Gold stars. You would do well to know that verse. You would do know well to memorize that verse. You need Next week, there's going to be a test. All right, there's going to be a test. But we need to do that because when we are crucified with Christ, we don't get stuck, right? We don't get stuck in the old man. We don't get stuck with the old ways. We don't get stuck there because the new, we put on the new man because the old man has been crucified with Christ and is no longer us who live, right? Galatians 2.20. And so everything is laid down to Jesus, total submission. So back to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live by faith I, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That verse right there, walk, living that out, what parts of that are is the easiest? And what's the part of that is the most challenging? Is it the crucified part? Is it the life living by faith? Is it the trusting in Jesus? What part is the most challenging and what part's the most easiest? Let's talk about that.
So this week there was a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. And there was a great deal of, of contention. This is one of the ones where I kind of want to see, I kind of want to know what's, what's happening. They left out a lot of detail. On. On There's a one. lot of details. Other than the fact is Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, felt compelled to put it in and to tell because he wrote the book of Acts to uh, his friend Theophilus. And so there was, there was that much contention. He's like, Theophilus, you need to know this. But he doesn't give any details about anything that actually happened. So we're going to pick up here in Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to 41. Just a little snippet here, but it goes into this the disagreement Paul and Barnabas had. Pastor, was anyone to read that? And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, or no, Cil Cilicia, strengthening the churches. All right, so here's the, here's the quick recap. Paul and Barnabas both, they wanted to go back and visit all the places they had just been. They wanted to go back to Iconium and Derby and Lystra and Antioch and Pisidia. They wanted to go back to all these places and basically visit the churches they had started, the leadership there. They wanted to, to talk to them, to encourage them. Now, Barnabas is like, hey, why don't we take John Mark with us? Now, who's John Mark? John Mark is Barnabas's cousin, right? So it's either, was it his, you know, the cousin, right? However that family relations work. And my mind just went totally blank. Whatever that family, family relationship worked, he was Barnabas's cousin. And John Mark is also the writer of the Gospel of Mark. So this is the same dude, right? So we know his work. He's the short gospel. He's that same guy, and he's actually Barnabas's cousin. Barnabas's cousin, and actually is mentioned throughout the New Testament as well. He was well-known, or he, he was well-known within the circle. And basically, Paul had said, no, he's not coming. And the reason why is because of Acts 13, 13. It's when they were on their first trip to these places, Antioch and Pisidia, Lystra, Derby, Economy, all this stuff, this is what happened. And now Paul and his companion set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. The John they speak of here is John Mark. This is the same dude. And so Paul's like, no. And so there's something in that moment back in Acts chapter 13 where he left, it left a bad taste in Paul's mouth. And we don't, it never says why. Uh, John Mark left. It never says, and doesn't mention why. But by the context of this a disagreement, it did not sit well with Paul. Paul was ticked off that this actually happened. He was irritated. And I guess the context here with, with Barnabas and taking him again, I guess we can infer that basically he was either punishing John Mark or he was afraid John Mark was going to do the exact same thing. We don't know what he did other than he left. But we do know John Mark was well-respected among the early church community. So it's not like John Mark was a bad guy. It's not the connotation. But there was a, there was a rift in that relationship. Why? Because it even, was even Paul was a guy. He was just a man. Barnabas was just a man. Peter was with all the, the, the frailties and inadequacies and insecurities. They have all this stuff going on here. So there's a strong disagreement. So much so, there was such a great debate between this. Actually, Scripture might say, depending on what translation, a great contention, a strong contention, that because Barnabas wanted John Mark and Paul didn't, Barnabas basically goes, fine. John's coming to me and we're going to Cyprus. And Paul goes, fine. I'll take Silas. We're going back to the, the other places we were going to go to. And so they separate. They separate. So the, the, they went on the first missionary. They separated. So... Barnabas took John Mark, went to Cyprus, and Paul took Silas and went back to the other things. Now, Silas, here's an interesting character as well, um, because Silas, um, everybody has a different name, and the reason why is because there's a Greek version, and then a Roman version, and then a Hebrew, sometimes a Hebrew version of the name, but Silas is also known as, in the New Testament, Sylvanius, or Sylvanus, or however you want to pronounce it. 
But this guy is actually mentioned throughout the entire New Testament. So Silas was the same guy who was, who was the prophet who was appointed to take the letter that we read about last week to tell the Gentiles that they, weren't gonna, they didn't have to be circumcised. But he's also mentioned in Corinthians. He's mentioned in, in Thessalonians 1 and Thessalonians 2. Uh, even Peter, as in uh, the book of Peter, the apostle Peter wrote it and mentions Silas or Sylvanians that he was a good dude. So this is, this is kind of a who's who of Christianity, this little tiff that's going on, this little upset. Now, we do know later on that Paul, John, Mark, and Barnabas all restore relationship. It's not like they permanently broke up, right? It's not like that. But they did leave the party in a huff, right? But they did restore relationship because actually eventually Paul in one of his letters, he goes, hey, send John Mark to me. He's useful. So, and that was after this. So there was a restore. And, the, and Paul always spoke well of Barnabas. Always spoke well because of who Barnabas and basically because Barnabas stood stood up for Paul. Kind of like how Barnabas is standing up for John Mark. Who knew? Apparently Paul didn't learn that lesson. So that comes down to this. And this is what we're going to talk about today is how do we handle conflict? How do we handle disagreements and contention and tension between people, believers or not? How do we handle conflict? conflict because handling conflict is so important to our life it, it controls our mental state and controls and affects our relationships we have with one another now in our life there will be conflict there's going to be conflict right if, i mean look at this the holy men here, right? I use the air quotation because, you know, some people like, lift these guys up on such a huge platform. I'm like, they're just dudes the great apostles who were called by God, right? That's literally what they were. But these guys have, they, they, they get into it. And so there's going to be conflict. It isn't something we can avoid. And how do we handle it as not just people, but as believers? Because we should be really, really good at handling conflict. And unfortunately, we're not. And there's something wrong with that. So here's a question for our communities here. Do you feel you handle conflict well? And if you do, back it up with a why. And if you don't, back it up with a why. Okay? So talk about it. How do you handle conflict? And why do you feel that either way? Let's talk about it.
Now, oftentimes when it comes to conflict, there's, there's some common causes. This is not an exhaustive list. But there are some common, common causes. There are some co commonality with causes. And one of this is just simply a lack of understanding that you're conveying with someone, you're talking with somebody, and the two parties don't understand where the other party is coming from. And sometimes it's because it hasn't been communicated by one party, and sometimes it's not understood by the other party. It takes both. It's both people's faults here, right? And so where they're coming from. The second one is a lack of agreement. So sometimes we, we understand where the other person was coming from, but we don't like it. You're like, your opinion's stupid, right? And that's, that's sort of the con. Your opinion's stupid. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. You're a dummy head, right? So have we heard that before? Have we heard that? Remember that in kindergarten? You're a dummy head. All right, so same concept, same deal, right? We, we, we play out and execute our conflict managed behavior at a very early age, right? Even little kids struggle with this, and they get magnified because they have no concept of emotional intelligence, and so they just lay it all out there. But it's the same concept is, number one, go back to the number one again, so that there's a lack of understanding, or the second one, they just simply, you don't like the other person's opinion. You don't, you don't agree with their statement. You don't agree with how they're going to do it or their methodology and their plan. And then there's a lack of agreement and there's a, a thing, a conflict with that. So for instance, back to uh, Paul and Barnabas, um, there was a lack of agreement. Paul says, I don't want him to come. And it's basically says, Barnabas, that's great. You have that opinion. I don't care. That's what Paul said. I don't care. We're not doing this. We're not, we're not acting this thing out. And now, whether it was understanding, well, we don't know that. There probably was some lack of understanding. He has, because either Barnabas didn't properly explain why he wanted John Mark, or Paul didn't care. So, but oftentimes it's a combination of, of those two things. And there might be some other contributors, but those, those are two big ones. So how, when conflict happens, what do we do? How do we resolve it? Now, human beings don't seem to handle conflict well. There's probably a million reasons for that. We're not going to get into that. But we don't handle conflict well. Now, handling conflict and how you handle conflict, and I guess... Do I need to define conflict or we already got everybody? This is self-explanatory things that we fight over things that make us irritated with somebody else. The, the steps and things that make you want to be angry at someone, all of those things, the things that make that. you want to take your ball and go home. Right. And, but there's conflict that leads to res, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's just disagreements over the way things should be done or how we feel about it. Paul took his ball and went to Antioch. Pisidia, Lystra, Derby, and he took Silas with him. Barnabas didn't have a ball, and he took John Mark, right? That's, that's what happened here. So James 1.19 kind of really lays out a great um, model of conflict management. So let's talk about this. This is James talking here. James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear Slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. These three components, right? I'm going to say them one more time. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. These three components. Let's go through these. This, this first part of this, this quick to hear. I mean, we need to be quick to hear. Now, what does this mean? This means that we listen to understand, not listen to launch a counterpoint. Okay, this is conflict management 101. We listen to understand where that person's coming from, their reasonings, their thoughts, their emotions, their history, their experience. We're listening to understand, not listening to see when they're done because we've already thought our counterpoint to their, to their logic, their experience, their emotions, their whatever I just said a minute ago, right? So we're listening to understand, not launch a counterpoint. Because oftentimes when a disagreement comes, occurs, we stop listening to understand the other person. We just, we turn it off because it becomes about my opinion. 
is different than yours and I like mine better. So we listen to understand. We're quick to hear. And actually, let me, let me say one more thing about that is, is in those moments when we stop listening to understand, when we start listening for a counterpoint, is really what we're doing. We're, we're, we are becoming very selfish in that because we feel our point is the most valid and it's more important than the other person's. Right? I'm going to say it one more time. That in that moment that we stop listening to understand is because we feel our point is more valid than the other person's or their point is not valid enough that I've chosen not to listen to it anymore. And in that moment, we become selfish. The Bible has a word for that. It's called sin. And it's not loving your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, 31. Right? It's sin. It's not honoring each other. Romans chapter 12. It's not honoring and preferring one another. It's not it. We busted. Conflict management, broken. Broken model. Next one. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. Uh, James talks, I, I think he talks, he expounds upon this a little bit, the slow to speak. In James chapter 3, verse 6 through 10, probably might have heard this before. But he says this. He goes, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord our God, and with it, we curse other people who are made in the likeness of God. For from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. I know another translation describes the tongue as a wanton killer, a serial killer, if you will, looking whom he may take out, right? That's our tongue. That's the words we are conveying, right? So that's why we have to be slow to speak because with our tongue, we can, we can bless people and we can abuse people. Remember, good words, it's called verbal abuse, right? That's a whole legal definition, right? So with our words, we can, we can lift up people or we can abuse people. And here's, here's the horrible part. We can do it intentionally and we can do it unintentionally. Right, so let me let me keep keep going back to this James analogy where he says it can uh, it can start a forest of fire. We can be an arsonist with our tongue, or we can be flagrant and start a, a forest fire when we're just merely camping. We can do either one, intentional or unintentional, but the results are still the same. The forest burns down, and people lose homes and animals die. That's this tongue. That's why we have to be slow to speak. So what does that mean? That means we don't lash out. We watch our words. We watch what we say because we don't want them to cause harm. We watch what we say. It's better to let the things unspoken and not hurt people than it is to say them and abuse people. It's better. Next part of that, slow to anger. All right, so we're, we're going to expound upon this a little bit more in just a second, but I'm just going to hit it real fast here, just, just a little bit here, is that we don't want conflict to grow in such a way that we despise the other person. Paul and Barnabas, we don't know how contentious this was other than they did separate, but we do know this, relationship was restored. So they understood They understood this part, right? Or, or that we don't want our, the animosity to grow in such a way that the relationship is busted. We don't want it to be that. So really what we're talking about in this whole thing is something we call emotional intelligence. But before we get to that, let's have a question. And of these three things, these, these uh, mine went blank. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Yes, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Which of these things are the easiest for you guys or for you to handle? Which one you're like, oh, I'm, I'm good at this one. And maybe in, even in that, you can say, oh, this one I'm a little, I need some more work on, right? So quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let's talk about it.
So really what James is talking about is emotional intelligence. We actually talked about that a little bit before our last four-minute break. And that um, this emotional intelligence really revolves around two different things because conflict usually involves uh, thoughts and emotions, feelings. I just threw up a little bit. Feelings. Feelings are valid and good. Jesus had feelings. He did, but sometimes they're less valid because they're not real. That is true. There are <laughs> okay. facts and there are feelings. Correct. There's facts and there's feelings. And sometimes they don't mix. Sometimes they do mix. And so that, this is the problem. Right. This is the problem. When we confuse these things, right? When we confuse these things. So we got, we got to talk about emotions. We got to talk about all this kind of stuff. And the more we understand these things, the better we handle conflict. And it's amazing how many people are oblivious to this, including Christians, including pastors, including people who claim to have a really good relationship with Christ, and they are oblivious in emotional intelligence. And I was like, no wonder why you're, it's chaos. No wonder. But that's not to be said of us. So let's go through this, right? Let's go through this. And actually knowing all this stuff doesn't make us better at doing it, but at least this makes us culpable in knowing what we should do. So the first one of these things is, as we believe that emotion intelligence is we have to be self-aware. We have to be self-aware. Some people are really good at this. Some people are not good at this, right? But everybody, if you want to handle conflict well, we all have to be, we have to be good at this, right? We have to nail this one, self-aware. What does that mean? Do you know why you feel the way you do in a conflict? So if there's a conflict going on and there's something that's happening and there's a moment of contention and there's all this, there's words that are said and there's facts that are being distributed, but there's also emotion and feelings coming up because anger is a secondary emotion. It's not a primary. You don't feel angry per se. You feel another emotion, such as hurt, betrayal, embarrassment, not being understood, and that expresses itself in anger, okay? That's the phrase, is no one can make you angry. It's true, no one can make you angry. Anger is a choice, right? There's all these other feelings and emotions that you feel, and then we choose to express that in anger. So when you're in a conflict with somebody and that you start getting angry, why? And what I mean by why is I'm not saying like, oh, you have no right to be angry. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying be self-aware and ask yourself, why are you feeling angry? Because when you, when you look at that and analyze that and look at that, why are you feeling angry? You're going to identify an emotion. Now you can deal with it. Because you're not going to attack the anger. You're going to attack and deal with the emotion. And when you can deal with the emotion, you can convey the emotion. And when you convey the emotion, you help the other person understand. That is if they really want to understand. i got to throw that in too. But it helps the other person to understand. So back to this Paul and Barnabas. Now, we don't know everything that was going on here, but... I was a strong contention. We don't know why or if Paul ever expressed why he didn't want John Mark. That's why I said I made some inferences. I guessed. But we don't know if that was ever discussed. And if it was, Luke wasn't privy to it. He didn't get the information. All right. How, where, was it? where am I at here? So back to that. Well, I'm going to illustrate this point again. When we can identify what we feel and communicate that, that brings understanding to the other person and only that but it brings you understanding because sometimes in those moments when we identify the emotion you're like that's stupid and what i mean by that is not not that that wasn't a valid emotion but when we stop and look at it and we feel the emotion it's like that's stupid that i feel this way because that's that has no bearing on this conversation that has no bearing in this conflict and it's just getting in the way and making a mess this is just dumb and then sometimes we only need to explain it. We just check in our mind. We're like, no, <laughs> I need to get back to what really matters. Or it could be sometimes when you get in a conflict, you're having a conflict with somebody and it reaches a contentious point 
and you start feeling anger and you take a step back and you identify the emotion, you realize the emotion emotion isn't even with the person you're having a conflict with, but somebody else and whom this conversation is reminding you of that previous time and you're taking it out on them. They ain't do anything, right? They ain't do anything at all. And so that's why that self-awareness is so important. So important. Because it helps conflict be handled better. Well, and it, it helps you process. And it, 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 again, all of these things are processes. This isn't something that you instantly figure out, instantly do. It's, it's taking time to figure out how do you move forward in this and where do you go from here? And that deep breath and that slow to speak is where that comes in, right? So slow to speak, James, slow to speak. Be quick to hear. The second one of these, so the first one is self-awareness. The second one is, is empathy. Empathy. So simple definition is putting yourself in the other person's shoes or understanding where they're coming from and not just where they're physically coming from, meaning with all the facts, but where they're coming from emotionally. What's their mental states? What's their emotional state, right? And I told you we're going to talk about all the feels, and I hope none of you guys have actually flipped off in the mind as I don't want to deal with all that, because you can flip it off right now, everything we're saying, and you are not going to be emotionally intelligent, and you're going to have horrible conflict management skills the rest of your life. Or we can clue into these things, and say, and really start asking the questions, and you're going to do well and better at these things. And things are going to work better. Your conflict is going to be better. Because you're always going to have conflict. Right. But how you handle it will be better. It's, it's, to me, I look at it in, the, in this way. You can get into a discussion and a conflict without going zero to 60. I was sitting next to a car this week. And was it a Tesla? No, it wasn't a Tesla. No. It was an SUV, and it had just recently had an other SUV. Was that a in Tesla? Front of it in, no, not a Tesla. Into the, the lane to turn left, right in front of them. And apparently, they thought that the person that cut them off to get into that lane, rather than getting in line, blah, 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 had flipped them off. Because I heard bleepity, 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 that driver, that driver, that Were they driver. they talking about a bleepity, Tesla? Bleepity, bleepity, no. About this person in a car that needed to get in a lane that didn't either know where they were going or were trying to get there that got in front of them. And in their mind, they thought they saw a finger on a steering wheel. I mean, it was loud because I was in my car with my windows up and I could hear this screaming. Their conflict. Their conflict and anger. And their poor conflict management skills. And their skills. poor conflict management skills literally explode next to me. And you know, that first fear of like, oh my gosh, are we going to see road rage happen right here? But thankfully, they, they she just expressed all of it verbally. But that is what we want to avoid, guys. There's no need for her to go to that level of emotion, stress, and the angst in her body. <laughs> just because, because the car, the car got, in got in front of her to get into the left turn lane. And she thought maybe that a finger was inappropriately placed on a steering wheel in her direction. Like, that was absolutely out of control, ridiculous. But that is what we're dealing with right now in our world. Because people don't have these skills. Something comes up and you instantly get... Blah! coming out of you. Even saw two people fighting in front of Goodwill the other day. Scream it was a busy week. Screaming were, were, were their Were they up. fighting over a Tesla? No. They were they were in fighting over something that had happened and it was not a Tesla and it was loud and it was scary and I'm like, we are not exiting this door for a while here and so So, so these are all examples of of bad conflict management and an example of empathy where empathy has to be heard because obviously that that person Pastor Rosanna had just said that kind of went off the light is there's something else going on there. There's something else going on. There's other issues that are happening for someone to react in such a manner. Something else is happening. And you can insert your own story. Like we can come up with an own story, but something else is going on there. So empathy is, is seeking to understand what's happening with the other person. And in the moment where we're seeking to understand quick to hear when, or quick to understand when we're seeking to understand, we are, we're, we are realizing it's not about us. 
We're actually honoring one another. We're preferring one another. We're thinking the best of someone else, thinking that's not your normal. I want to understand why you are where you are. Quick to listen, listening to understand, right? And in that moment, we're doing that. We're loving our neighbor as ourself. That's when we're doing, when we're practicing empathy, where we're listening to understand. Now, when we don't listen to our neighbor, we become self-important. And then we don't love our neighbor as herself, right? But in all these things, we can see this James chapter 1, verse 19. Quick, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. We can see we can see these things. So being self-aware, why do I feel what I feel? Why? Why does this conflict, why does this issue I'm dealing with it, why is it so important to me? And why do I have so much feeling and emotion about it? That doesn't mean what you think is wrong. But what it does is it helps you understand it so now you can communicate it. So the other person can listen and understand. And you can share to be understood. And then we have empathy, that we understand where the other person is. So if they're at that point of contention, that point of intense emotion, that we can seek to understand because maybe the, the, what they're feeling and, and, and going through their concepts and perceptions of what is happening is, that's not what you meant. But when you can hear it, you're like, okay, Here's what I actually meant. Here's my thoughts and feelings. And then you can get back on the same page. But you have to understand this whole thing, it takes, it takes Holy Spirit-driven people to engage in discussion like this. But this is the way it's supposed to be. You're like, well, I've never done that before. Okay, well, you, you, now you have a goal. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's perfect all the time because sometimes... This stuff becomes so poignant and emotional and powerful that we throw this stuff out the window. I insert the case of Paul and Barnabas, these men of God. But this has to be our default, and we have to get better at it. And it's a process. So how do we do these things? Well, in the moment, we stop and ask questions of ourselves. Right? We ask, why am I angry? Why do I feel this way? And it might even mean a timeout. Like, I need a break for a second. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> you can collect yourself. And in that timeout or in that moment, we're asking these questions. What we're really doing is we're asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, why am I so heated about this? Why is this so important to me? Why do I feel like this about this thing? thing why is it so and that's a self-awareness because it's literally a mental step back and you look at yourself and you and, and you you analyze if you step take a step back and you look at yourself it goes andrew why are you like that you're saying dumb things you may not be making sense anymore what are you doing and so it's taking that taking a step back and asking these questions and asking them of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me. And you know what will happen? The Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what's happening. He is good at finding the roots. He will. He will oh. expose that emotion, and he will do everything else. And then you'll have to deal with it. And you're like, okay, well, I feel betrayed. And maybe that's what Paul was feeling, betrayed. That's a, betrayal is a strong emotion. Woo, that's high on the power level, Right? But when you can identify it, then, then you can deal with it. You're like, oh, why do I feel betrayed? Well, I feel betrayed because this happened and then this happened. And sometimes even in that betrayal, as I just said, that other person you're talking with, they're not the ones who betrayed you. But you're in a similar circumstance where you were betrayed and now you're afraid, fear is also one of those strong emotions, that you'll be betrayed again. So you have two power, you can have two power emotions in the same conflict. See how this works? Am I, am I painting this picture? So we take that moment. We have this conversation with the Holy Spirit, and he's going to provide answer. And here's the thing is, when we can take a step back and ask those questions, why do I feel the way, why do I, feel the way I do? It's a point of, it's a position, better word, position of humbleness. It's being humble. 
that we, when we take a step back, goes, why do I feel this way? We're, we are realizing and acknowledging we are not perfect. And we're taking that, not that in that same step, we're saying, I want to serve this other person I have a conflict with. So why do I feel this way? Not asking it of them. You know, why are you making me feel this way? Yeah. No, that's a, that's, that's not a, almost not a valid statement. Right, Cause we have our, I remember hearing this person is like, your children cannot make you feel anything as a mom, when I was in the midst of the little kids and I was like, you know, sometimes you hear that you're driving me crazy. Like they don't drive you crazy. You have a choice. You handle your emotions, your things, your stuff. And you have to learn how to process those things. And that's hard. And it's hard to admit that you're feeling those things. And it's hard to say, well, this is really why I'm feeling like this because then you're vulnerable and then you let point people, of that point of humbleness and that that place of, you know, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's not about me anymore. It's about him and our coming together for a common purpose to accomplish whatever task it is that you're facing. So here, here's a question. Which is easier for you? Self-awareness or empathy? Or maybe neither of them are easy, right? <laughs> Share that too. Maybe you're like, I got this. Well, if you, if you got both of that, I'll let everybody else in the room judge. No, but 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 let's talk about that. Which do you find easy, easier? Is it the self awareness or is it the empathy? Let's talk.
So Paul talks about in uh, Ephesians, he's, he's going on a tirade here in, in Ephesians chapter 4. And he reaches a point where, you know, people who aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And then that's where we pick up in verse 19. Rosanna, you want to read this? Yeah. Through 27. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn to Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God into righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity for the devil. All right, so this is a big, thick passage, and we would do all well to go back and read that again. But moving right on for for time's sake, is Paul speaks up, and he basically says, he goes, don't put on the old man. Don't be like the old guy before Christ. Don't be that dude. Don't be that person, right? Put on the new man. Put on this new guy. Put on this born again guy. Put on this guy who's been crucified with Christ. Put that guy on. And then he says, be angry, but don't sin. Once again, anger is not sin. The anger becomes sin when, well, we'll hit that in a minute. (laughs) Well, here, here, I'll say this and I'm going to hit it again here in a second. Anger becomes sin when we hurt people with it. We hurt people with it. Or if we choose to hold on to it and allow bitterness to grow. And that hurts us. So back to the same thing, when it hurts people. When it hurts people. Because conflict is going to happen. And sin happens, that's the second part I was going to say, sin happens when we let conflict destroy relationships, Sin happens when we lash out with our words and our actions and cause hurt. Sin happens when we become self-important. Right? We, we kind of defined all this stuff before. We're just hidden again. Sin happens when we raise ourselves higher than other people. Right? When we don't practice self-awareness. Anyway, sin happens when we can't forgive people for the conflict. How could they do that? Well, uh, I can give you a thousand reasons. Some might be sinful. Some may not. Some might just be obliviousness. I can give you a thousand reasons for any particular things. Once again, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. You would do well. We would do well to memorize this verse. Say it together now as a group. (laughs) Read this out loud on the screen. We'll put it up there. Ready? Ready, set. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but it's Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We would do well to memorize this verse, right? We have been crucified with Christ. The old guy's gone. It always comes back to this. It always comes back to this. This is the issue. This is the nature of renewing your mind. This is the nature of putting on the new man. This is what it means to being in Christ, having the mind of Christ. This is it. This is it. This is it. And we as believers have to handle conflict well. You know why? Because we've been crucified with Christ. If we've really been crucified with Christ, we're, we are okay with working on conflict. We're okay with conflict. God's okay with conflict. He handles it all the time. Right? We're okay with handling conflict because we've been crucified with Christ and we know it's not all about us. And we're okay with that. Because it's no longer us who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now, these things that are part of the old life, they should not be part of the new life. The way we used to handle conflict should not be a part of how we handle conflict now as believers. We have to work that out. That's that transformational process. That's that metamorphosis that needs to happen. But let's put on the new man. Let's do this James chapter 1, verse 19. to be uh, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And seek help from the Holy Spirit, and he will empower you. He will help you in this. Self-awareness, empathy, taking those steps back, 
asking for input of the Holy Spirit, seeking to understand what's happening and understanding the emotional things that this conflict is stirring up inside of you will help you handle it better. And it'll just help you handle life better. Right? It'll help you have peace. Help you handle peace to be able to handle this. And here's the thing is, God wants you to handle things well. He really does. He doesn't want you to be freaked out in the conflict. He wants to help you handle it well so that other person can be honored and blessed and that you can be honored and blessed. And you can both be heard and seek a resolve. That's what he wants for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, that you've given us tools to handle conflict well. So help us. Help us to be that quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, Father. So we would seek to be, we would seek to understand. And Father, when conflict happens, Father, we would handle it well, honoring people, reaching that point of humbleness that, Father, we ask the questions of ourselves. Why do I feel these ways? So Father, we can better explain and so we can reach a resolve that will honor all the parties involved. Thank you, Lord God, that we have the mind of Christ and you've given us your peace. And that's what we practice because we have been crucified with you. In Jesus' name.